Thank you, everyone. And now we'd like to welcome Matt back to the stage with Stephen Keith, CEO of Labrador Uranium. <laughs> Gentlemen. I know you were. Do you want another cast? Oh, yes. Oh, um, for Matt many. Gordon, for sure. Hi, how are you? Right. How are you? Where do you want me, Matt? Oh. Next door? Yeah. We can sit over there if you want. I could. <laughs> I'm trying to get through COVID. I've got to get closer to people now. Tim, Tim, you've just come back from a super spreader in, in Toronto, haven't you? Uh, it, it was a super spreader two years ago. I'm hoping it wasn't. Oh, I'm hearing all sorts of stories. <laughs> right. Um, so, okay, I'm looking forward to this. We spoke yesterday, so it's, yes. it's, it's quite a cool story. Um, I want to kick off. Tell everyone who you are, first of all. Oh, excellent. Um, my name is Stephen Keith. I'm the CEO of Labrador Uranium. New company, we just started listing on the CSE in March of this year. Okay, brilliant. We're hunting uranium, right? We're trying. Very topical, very, very topical. Hey, so give everyone a close sense of the, your background um, and maybe a little bit about the team, because th th some of the team I know and recognize, some heavy hitters in there. Okay, so uh, by way of background, I'm a, I'm a geological engineer. Mm -hmm. used to work uh, as an engineer at mines and, and hydropower projects for years. Uh, sold my soul into investment banking for several years. I enjoyed it. Um, but the engineer in me kept wanting to build things. And so some of my clients at the time, this is about 2010, came to me with an idea of building a company. And I loved it. And uh, after that, I've just, I've really enjoyed this part of it. And uh, this is our, this is the latest company we built, which is Labrador Uranium. Um, and the reason I'm here and the reason I'm building this is not just the, the, the uranium thesis, which is very strong and terrific, um, it's about people. And I think this entire industry focuses a lot on assets, but we need to take that step back and focus on who the people are. Do you want, do, who's on the board? As an investor point of view, you've got to know, you know, have they done it before? And do they know how to put the brakes on a team? Do they know how to do stuff? So if we've got, you know, my chairman's Phil Williams. Phil, I think, was just talking up on the screen a few so minutes ago. Oh, good. I thought you meant he passed away. No, 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 he, okay, he was okay. on the screen. He didn't, he didn't come. Um, and he's built consolidated uranium. They've been buying up uranium assets globally and, and are now focused on building out a project in the United States. Um, Richard Patricio is also on my board. He is, you know, very long uranium guy. Mm. That mega uranium is on the board of NextGen. Um, and then uh, to, to not be totally uranium focused, Justin Reed is on our board. He's the CEO of Troilus. Um, and, and actually, we've run in previous companies that both he and I had. We've run into each he, other before. He was on DPLO's board. Pardon me? Uh, Justin was on DPLO's board, wasn't he? Was uh, he was... Or advisor? I think you're right. I think you are correct. I before know. he joined us, Occ yes. Occasionally, I am. And then we do have a fourth uh, board member. She just joined, uh, Brigitte Burnetch. Uh, she came through, Justin. They, she, they knew each other well. but. Fundamentally, we wanted to bring more independence and someone who could chair an audit committee. Right, okay. So we've we got, we got a good team. We always look at the things that are important for tech. Yeah. Good team. Brilliant. Yes. Tech. Uh, need good assets. So p you've had some assets vended in. Yep. Let's run through those because I want to pick you up on some of things. So three fundamental assets all within the same region. So as the name states, we are Labrador Uranium. So it's all Labrador. So the first asset we got came out of Consolidated Uranium. It, uh, it's a project called Morin Lake. It has a historical uranium and vanadium resource on it. And that's why we liked it. Although we're an exploration play, having something to underpin your value and that we believe grows significantly was a really good start. Then we, while we were still private, we then did a deal with Altius. Um, from the last uranium boom to today, Altius basically consolidated that entire belt mm -hmm. that you know, in 2010 we saw probably $100 million spent on. Um, and so we've got this entire 139,000 hectare belt with over 140 uranium and copper showings throughout it. And that's the guts of what we have. So this, this asset with historical resource, this massive belt, and then we brought on in our final deal, a deal with Mega Uranium, where we got their Mustang Lake project. Um, it has had drilling success. We know there's uranium there, but it hasn't seen, you know, it hasn't been broadened out into a resource. So really neat package of like where we know there's resources, we know there's, there, there's metal in the ground, now it's our job to try to turn that into something real. Right, but here's the hard bit for you. It's low grade. Yes. You're in Canada. That's an anathema to Canadian uranium investors. Yeah. How do you take this thing forward? Look, I think we have to be realistic. 
Um, we will never see the grades that we do in Saskatchewan, so that can't be our play. So, it, it, you know, although there's a clear view that grade is king, and it is, grade is very forgiving, um, I always try to look at things from an economic point of view. What, can we make money? Was, that's pretty important in what we You're do. You're a people person, and you yeah. also look at economics. I like money. It's, it's good. That's why we're okay. here. So, um, for these projects to work where we are, mm. we need size. Mm -hmm. So the Michelin deposit, which is owned by Paladin, is 120 million pounds at surface. That's part two. You want this at surface. The deeper it goes, the more expensive it is. That doesn't help you. So um, we are going to be significantly lower grade, like, the, the, like Paladin is sitting, that Michelin deposit is sitting around 850 ppm, right? So that's what, 0.08%, 0.085 versus 1, 2, 3%. Um, so back to the basics. Bulk tonnage at surface. And then the third piece of the puzzle, and large enough obviously, but the third piece of that puzzle is one of the great things this, this, this belt has is it's not just uranium. So our first historical resource is uranium and vanadium, which is great because mm -hmm. it plays into the same, vanadium plays into the same thesis as uranium, which is an energy metal. Um, the, the belt was originally discovered and worked up for copper. And although the copper work never got the same treatment as the uranium with respect to drilling and the tens of millions of dollars spent, um, there's probably more copper in this system than uranium. When Altius put it together, their main targets were all IOCG targets. Um, and although our focus is uranium, that's what we're training our, our team. So we've, we've built, we're building our own AI, and there are, the two people behind it have built machine learning AI for mining before. And with all of this historical data, the copper, the uranium, the old geophysics, the structural data, um, you know, we think that there are multiple things that are going to be found in here, and that makes the project in the region much more forgiving. Right, okay, you've gone through a, a lot there, yeah. okay. IOCG, iron ore, copper, gold, brilliant, um, but you need the scale for that. It's low-grade copper, oh, sorry, low-grade um, uranium. But, so so let's, let's, let's start with that yeah. bit. There are parallels with obviously Paladin you've referenced there, but also in Africa, we're low grade, open pit, shallow, hopefully, um, works economically. Absolutely. So you've got a big job to tell Canadians that that's true because they're not buyers. No, and, and it is important. You've got to look at the global context. So Paladin, who owns the mine with the project right beside us, their project in Namibia, which they're, re, like they're restarting now and they've just funded mm. for it, that's a very similar size and grade to what we have here. Now, let's be clear. It's easier to dig and it's Namibia, so it will be a lower operating cost. So, you know, to, if it's the same mine from there here, you still need a higher price to make it work. Um, there are mines, however, so you're, that's sort of 800, 850 ppm. There are operating mines in places like, I think it's, I might get this wrong, but I think it's in Kazakhstan, there's at least two that are like below 200 ppm. So again, though, that means you need to be at surface and this thing needs to dig easily for that to work. Um, and so, but it's not, it's not uncommon. And what we see in Saskatchewan, mm. like that's like, it's like finding Bo Boise's Bay, right? Like it's just a giant mountain of nickel that everyone says, yay, let's mine this for the next 100 years and make money. Y you don't have that everywhere in the world, so the rest of us have to deal with other types of projects, but, but make them economic. Okay, so we, we've seen a lot of juniors kind of struggle through the, the past few years, obviously price recovery from the end of last year from 30 to, I think we're up circa 60, circa, we'll say 60. Um, and if you can't, if you, yeah, and if you term contracts being signed, it, it, all, it all helps with the kind of momentum, but it's a very painful and lonely place being a junior. Why don't you just go and buy the Palladium uh, uh, Paladin project? Uh, well, firstly, it's owned by a company worth a few billion dollars. But they, it's non-core. It's non-core, but I think you've got to be careful how you answer these questions. But fundamentally, if, if Paladin's going to do a deal with us, we need to become a real company. And although we are a real company, we're 35 million market cap. Money talks. 17 million in cash. Like, there's not, there's not enough there yet, I don't think. Would, is there something to be done? It would be great. But if you look at the team yep. and the good track record of raising capital when they, when they need to, yep. if you look at the team and you've got the money, surely there's a conversation to be had. It's, it, it'll get you to where you need to be a lot quicker. I would never say no. And I think fundamentally in what we do as a junior company, you've got to focus on finding stuff but you talk to everyone, right? Like this idea when someone asks a company our size, you know, what's your exit? And the answer is, oh, we're gonna build a mine. Great strategy, it's not gonna happen, statistically. Yeah. Yeah. 
And so if people do want to buy you, if they do want to take you out, um, it's always worth that conversation. Or if you want to buy a non-core asset from someone and bulk up to become that bigger company, you always have to entertain it. Um, you just got to figure out the how. So you have every conversation, you make every pitch, and you see where it, where it comes. But those take time. Deals like that take time. Okay. Your land package is massive. Yes. It's a liability, I would argue. So you need to dump as much as you can as soon as possible. So uh, maybe talk us through the process of how you're going to go about assessing what you've got. So look, it's a, it is a giant line package, and there are almost more targets than you can do anything with. So that is why we're doing both the hard rock and and then the AI, the machine learning, because you, you know, the first year of these claims, you know, the, 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 it just gets more, every year you hold a claim, it gets more expensive in Labrador. And so your first year or two, whatever, right? You, you figure that out, but you want to get off of that quickly if there's nothing there. So we start with, at the high end level, processing 50 years of historical data, seeing where the best targets are, because in a region like this, we, we, we've got to be looking for billion dollar targets, not hundred million dollar targets, because that's just the nature of the economics of where we are. Um, and so areas that don't show anything or don't have the right structural you know, parameters, whatnot, you want to kill as quickly as possible. Um, you can't drill at all, so you sometimes have to take a risk. But I think that'll be a two year process. I don't want to drop anything yet. But as we look at the map maps, as we look at the historical data, there are some areas that start to look, okay, maybe we need to find a reason to kill this one quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but to start with, more importantly, we want to identify where are the key projects. So are there four or five yeah. core areas? And then we see what we do. Because as you say, right, like, how do you turn an exploration something in, company into something real? You cannot bring 15 projects to light. Like, it would be great to have, but that's, it's expensive and you run away and then you lose focus. And so you, we do have to figure that out. Right. What you said is really important is the fact that you, you need a kind of cluster of targets to kind of come good for you because the scale, because the grade is super, super important for you. Um, begs the next question, which is given where you are, infrastructure, you need to, we need to, do we need to layer that on top as a uh, potential cost if you get as far as that? Look, if you get that far along, yes. Now that is in a way a Hollywood problem because if you're having that discussion, you've made a great discovery. Um, we've already got the Michelin deposit there. So, you know, does it on its own merit the roads that need to get built up to there? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I do know that back in the day, they were already looking to permit a road and grading the claims for that. Um, but if a second project gets found, now all of a sudden, hmm. you've got more than one use for it, that, that comes down. Like a single mine that's marginal in that area, is just it becomes more marginal because you do have to build the infrastructure. Um, and so that's, again, why we need the size and why we need more than one. And that's, that's the goal. Because, again, it's, it's like the ring of fire in Ontario, right? There's, there's been so much action there for over a decade. But until the government goes and says, which they have in Ontario, says, we're going to build the road and the infrastructure, there was very little to do once you'd made those big discoveries. Because when you have to layer in an extra billions for infrastructure, it kills, it kills projects. OK, so you, you're kind of sitting with a kind of group of small uranium juniors, uh, some of whom could be accused of jumping on the bandwagon because their thematic's awesome, mm -hmm. um, without the actual know how to kind of move this thing forward. So t talk us through how you move this thing forward and why your project matters. So c cash is looking like what at the moment? Look, our cash is great. We're sitting at about 17 million cash. Right. So it's about half our market cap. Okay. Um, because it's our first year program, although we can spend on this kind of land everything we get, uh, we're going to do this intelligently. And so it, it, it's an iterative process. So our first budget exploration is going to be in the five, six million dollar range. Okay. Right? We learn from that what we have, and then we determine next year. And markets will play into that as well. You always have to watch out for markets. You don't want to dilute. Look, we, explorers always have to raise. But be smart. When the market's hot, bring in your money so that when it's dead, you can survive. Maybe you slow down the exploration. Um, but you know, to, to answer that question, what the thing that's going to make the difference in any of these explorers, and we can talk about all the different pieces, but all the CEOs and technical guys are waving their arms saying, this is awesome. This is why. This is the very best next thing. None of that matters until you stick holes in the ground and try to build a resource. And so my very first view on any any of these companies and have no one in mind in truth, but like is 
if their money isn't really geared towards making a discovery, but you know, let's clean up the package, let's do this, let's find this, then I, I have less interest because that's the only thing that matters. Right? There's either a resource there or not. If it's not there, you move on. You take your cash, hopefully you still have some, and you find another project until you get to the point where you find the thing that's going to make your investors and yourselves lots of money. Right. So, so I'm, I'm kind of intrigued on that, the process of where you are now through to maybe becoming a mine. Most, as you say, will fail and fall, fall off the tracks al along the way. How, where do you intend to take this through to? So just, I need to understand it because I want to make sure I'm not hung out to dry if I invest in your company. Yep. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. So I think when you look at some of the guys involved, like Richard and Phil, for example, um, they've been long uranium and kept companies alive even in the downturn. So that gives me much more confidence in, in what we plan on doing. Um, and we've raised a combination of hard dollars and flow through. So flow through money is great because that's what you put into the ground. It's very, very efficient, especially for investors, but you have to spend it. So that's great. You put all your flow through into the ground, you keep your hard money so that when and if markets turn, you will survive. Um, and we have a group of people behind us and a really good set of institutional investors where um, if we do our job, we're not overly concerned about finding money to keep it going, uh, but we're in good shape anyways for the next two years anyways. But um, how do you turn this into something real? Look, it, it, like I said with the geology, it's iterative. So we, we, we go after more in Lake this year, we try to expand it. We see if this shows the, the possibilities of being a mine in this area, understanding the constraints of Labrador and the costs. And as we look at start, some of the other targets start floating to the top, then, then those are the decisions you make. Do you, ra do you raise more money so you explore two things at once? Does more in Lake not become what we want it to be? and something else. So, so it's, a, it's a constant decision of where to prioritize your money, but in the end, it's where is, going to, where, where is the project that can be built? And that's all you're looking for each time. So if one feels marginal, you go after one a little more perhaps, right? But if one is looking really good, then some of those other ones have to slow down, depending on you know, how cash constrained you are. But it's a combination of you watch the market, both the public market and sort of the M&A market, right? Like in the end, um, would I love to build a mine as an engineer? Of course I'd love to build a mine. In the end, companies like this don't build mines, right? And, and I'm not saying that that's not some, we're never gonna build, we're all for sale. It's, it's not that, it's just a matter of what the realities are of the commodity we're in, of the size of project we need to have. Um, but until I can't build it, I'm going to build it. Do you know what I mean? Like it's... it's yeah. Okay, you sit on another couple of boards, but there's your only other, there's your only CEO gig, right? Correct. And this is where your time and attention is being spent. This is this is my job. The, the CEO positions are not sorry, the CEO. The board positions. It's two, and it's it's quarterly work. It's it's right. not mind numbing. But this is look. We just took a bunch of people's money. We raised twenty million dollars in under a year. We listed the company, and we made a lot of promises of the work we need to do. That's what I have to do, and okay. so that's what I'm going to focus on. And you put in how much money yourself? Oh, I wish I knew. If I'd say, I'm not a very rich man, I wish I was, but I'd say almost $100,000, okay. which for me is a lot of money. It might not be a lot for some of you, I apologize. But, uh, but the insiders and the board all invested at every round. Okay. So from, there were no free shares, and we do have board members or others who have put more in, mm -hmm. because they could. Um, and I think about 5% of the company right now is owned by, by management and board. Okay, so you feel that with the cash you've got, you're, you're gonna set up for what, the next 18 months or so, two years? Minimum 18 months, you can easily make it to two years because again, those decisions are made on, on, on the capital markets. Yeah. Uh, but for the kind of program we have, it's 18 months to two years for sure. That kind of feels quite nice at the moment. Feels really nice. Yeah. Look, I, when we did our two financings, um, we, we ended up, sometimes it's good to be lucky, and we ended up in two perfect windows for uranium. The first one, we were actually at one of the investment banks that focuses on us. They were having a conference right while there was a uranium boom, so we didn't even market it. We raised the money in the midst of that. My first meeting gave us, gave us a lead order. Uh, and then the second financing, uranium was returning, but it was also a, a flow-through financing, so in Canada, those do tend to be easier. Um, just because of the tax benefits, but then you have to be careful of, of who's buying that back end, right? So you actually spend more time not looking for the money, but looking for the guys who are gonna take it so it doesn't 
flood your market. Okay, well, it's down to you to make it work now. So good That's luck with that. That's the job. Well, thank you very much. And Cheers, uh, hopefully in a year, I can tell you what I found. Good. Thank you.